Hello, everyone. Welcome to our quarterly wrap up. Today, we'll be talking about the fourth quarter of 2019, as well as 2019 as a whole. My name is Paul Stages. I'm a senior advisor here at Francis Financial, and I've got the pleasure to be joined with my colleague, associate advisor, Devon Barrett. Hello, everyone. Good afternoon. So our hope is that today is uh, more of a discussion, a conversation, and less so a lecture. So for those of you joining us at home or at work, uh, if you want to send us questions, the chat feature is live. So feel free to shoot us a question and We'll try to do our best to get to it as soon as we see it. If not, we can also address them at the end of the presentation. So jumping into it today. Thank you again, everyone, for attending. So what we saw in the fourth quarter of 2019 was really a continuation of what we saw uh, in 2019 as a whole, a really strong performance across the board. So in the US stock market, we saw returns of up over 9% in just the quarter. Uh, developed international stocks, so stocks from companies that are in areas like Europe, Japan, Canada, were up nearly 8% in the quarter. Emerging market stocks led the way in the quarter at up almost 12%. And in the U.S. bond market was essentially flat for the quarter, up for the year, and in the quarter was about 18 basis points. So all asset classes were up. And you know, while these are returns that we, if we saw this for a year, we would be ecstatic. So let alone just see that for the quarter, really underscores just the type of return numbers that we were seeing last year. And this chart looks specifically at what we saw in the S&P 500, that it was up more than 30% in 2019, just tr truly eye-popping returns. Mm -hmm. um, the stock market got off to a really strong start in the first quarter, we saw about 14%. Uh, then more modest gains of four and 2% in the second and third quarter. And then as I mentioned, that 9% return really buoyed. So it was, a, as you see with the chart, it was a really smooth upward ride for the year. Not something that we can plan for year over year, nor would we, but it is important to know that, you know, there was some cushion added to investors' portfolios last year based on the numbers that we were seeing. Now, that being said, this does come with a cost. So U.S. stocks, that means right now, based on the strong performance that we've seen, U.S. stocks are overpriced. Specifically, so if we look at the metric, the P.E. ratio, the price to earnings ratio, it's a commonly used metric to determine if a stock, specifically on a holding, is overvalued. So a higher P.E. ratio points to a really overvalued stock. And if we look at the, the chart and the trend over the last decade or so, we see essentially other than when we were coming out of the Great Recession in 2008, you know, we've been on an upward trend as far as how stocks are being valued. So right now we've hit a really high point, about 22.6 as far as what the P.E. ratio is. So that does point to an overvaluation. And that being said, that means you can get more bang for your buck by investing in other areas of the market right now. Yes. And... Other areas of the market are the rest of the global market. So think uh, Canada, Europe, Australia, Japan, India, China, all of these markets did really well in 2019. So after a strong fourth quarter, every major market across the globe had positive returns for the year. Uh, all of the major economies that you see on this screen here, other than India, they all had returns of at least 10%. So really phenomenal growth across the board. Um, and then to tie into something that Devon was mentioning before, we are seeing that the US has had a phenomenal run over the last 10 years. Um, you know, that's the good thing. The, the somewhat negative with that is that it is trading at much more expensive prices than we've seen the average and also the its foreign counterparts, the non-US. So looking at the chart over here, non-US developed. So again, Canada, Europe, Japan, Australia is represented by this black line here, is trading cheaper than US stocks, which is represented by the teal color. And then in blue are the emerging markets which look to be trading at an even deeper discount than the developed markets. So you can't necessarily say that looking at this, the non-US will outperform the US because as we've seen, the US market has generally been more expensive than the non-US markets over the last 10 years. However, it could be an indication that 
holding all of these is going to help boost your odds of having positive returns in the near to long-term future. Um, speaking of that longer term outlook, Devon mentioned some pretty gaudy numbers from the last 12 months when we look at the US stock market, developed international emerging markets and bonds. I mean, these are phenomenal returns, but as Devon said, don't necessarily get used to them. Uh, however, when we look at the last five years, the last 10 years, we do see that all of these different asset classes have had strong returns, particularly the US market. So while it would have been nice to see double digit returns from say the emerging markets, from your bonds, that would defeat the purpose of having a well diversified portfolio. We would expect looking at pretty much any time frame that you're not going to see the same types of returns across the board. And that's the idea is to not have all your eggs in one basket to get a variation of returns. But overall, we're thrilled to see these returns because uh, as our clients have seen in their portfolios, they you would not have lost money in any of these asset classes if you stayed with them over the last one, five, or even 10 years. And switching gears a bit, each quarter, we like to make sure that our listeners are, you know, kept abreast of what happened in the news uh, in the last quarter. And this is specifically important for this wrap up, as a good portion of the movements that we saw in the global stock market were impacted directly by what was going on in the headlines. So specifically starting here in the US, we saw, you know, some really strong signs of a healthy US economy, and specifically with the jobs reports, you know, each jobs report last year was relatively strong. And that was no uh, different in Q4. Specifically, if we look at the November jobs report, about 250,000 jobs were added to the US economy in November alone, which completely beat the expectation of about 185,000 jobs. And if we look at how that compared to a year ago, November 2018, which was a strong time, only 195,000 jobs were added. So that just goes to underline how strong that, that jobs report and what the US economy looks like for 2019. Um, and this really helped to ease fears that a US recession was right around the corner because at this time last year, the sentiment was that we were waiting for the other shoe to drop. And now it seems that that fear has been pushed off just a bit. Also, the Federal Reserve stepped in to help boost the economy by cutting interest rates. Uh, we didn't see any interest rate cuts in the quarter, but we did see three throughout the year in 2019. And that we really start to see the performance in the stock market based on those cuts in the fourth quarter. So what the Federal Reserve is trying to accomplish when they are cutting rates is they're trying to stimulate the economy by essentially making money cheaper to access. And with cheaper money, it really boosts the idea of lending and investing and helps to boost the stock market. And this was no different than we saw in 2019 as previous rate cuts. Now, on the not so positive side, we did see political tensions really ruling the headline and moving global markets. Uh, specifically in China, or, you know, it seems like every day that you turn on the news, you saw a, a news about headline about the trade war. And luckily, these anxieties were eased a bit in the fourth quarter. So on December 15th, uh, tariffs were set to be increased. Uh, and luckily, a, a phase one trade deal was reached at the 11th hour right before tariffs were set to increase. And this really provided some relief for both US stock markets and emerging stock markets as well, because China is really the major player in the emerging market space. So by, you know, that being said, we're not sure what the actual shakeout of the deal will be in the long term, but for the short term, we know that, you know, at least the agreement of committing to buy US agriculture, as well as stricter oversight of business practices, really help to ease the tensions and boost those stock markets in the areas that I just mentioned. Similarly, there were tensions eased with the EU, uh, there were talks of tariffs being placed on European auto exports. And luckily, when it came down to it, this was not put into place. So this helped to ease the fears that we were seeing to drag down and develop international performance. So there's a little boost there in the quarter as well. Unfortunately, there's still some uncertainty. Uh, last quarter, when we did our wrap up, we were talking about a potential impeachment. Um, and that's pretty pertinent right now is that that is still going on, that trial is going on as we speak. Uh, you know, it should be ending this week. We don't know. Regardless of what the outcome is, as we mentioned in Q3, in, historically impeachments haven't really moved the market based on that outcome alone. So that's something we're not worried about. 
But the uncertainty does still arise, as I mentioned, around the potential trade deal with China. While we've reached an agreement in principle right now, those negotiations are still ongoing. And as I mentioned, we don't know what the longer term implications will be on the stock market. So we do have an eye on it. And as Paul mentioned, that's why we want to diversify, not put too many eggs in one basket, so that regardless of what the outcome will be, your portfolio will be buoyed from those whipsaw movements if you have you know, US exposure, developed international exposure, and that bond exposure as well. Yeah, and then sticking with the government, uh, there was some news coming out of Congress at the end of the year uh, where they passed the so-called SECURE Act. It, it is an acronym, it uh, stands for the Setting Every Community Up for Retirement Enhancement Act. It was signed into law on December 20th, 2019. So of course, right around the time that people were going away on vacation for the holidays, that's when Congress decided to kind of sneak this one in. Uh, and then come 2020, people are sort of digesting the fallout from it. Uh, it is a far reaching bill. It includes a lot of significant provisions. Most of them are aimed at increasing access to tax advantage accounts uh, and preventing older Americans from outliving their assets. Some of it, as we'll discuss today, is aimed more at Congress collecting taxes sooner than later. Um, so looking at what we see as a positive is that required minimum distributions now start at age 72. Um, this is for folks who have yet to turn uh, age 70 and a half, which was the previous age requirement. So to take though a step back of, if you're not familiar with what is a required minimum distribution, it's when you have a tax deferred account. So think uh, your employer 401k or uh, an IRA, a traditional IRA that you've been deferring taxable income to. It's been growing every year very nicely. You haven't paid any taxes on it. Well, the IRS will only allow those good times to go on for so many years where it used to be that come age 70 and a half, it was time for you to start taking a little bit every year out of these accounts so that they, Uncle Sam can essentially take his cut and then you can use that money either for your expenses or to reinvest uh, into your portfolio. Well, the Congress acknowledged that people are living longer and are also working later into their lives. So they pushed the required minimum distribution out to age 72. So it's a positive because now if you have a 401k, you can enjoy another one to two years of deferring the taxes in those accounts before you have to start taking it out as taxable income. I alluded to what we view as a negative, and this is one such provision where there's no more of the so-called stretch provision when it comes to inheriting tax deferred accounts like an IRA. Um, so imagine you are in your 40s, you're entering, if not already, in the prime earning years of your life. Um, and if you inherit a non-spousal IRA, so typically this is coming from a grandparent or your parent, an aunt, uncle, um, you receive their IRA. This is money that's never been taxed in their life. And you receive it under the old rules, you would have to start taking required minimum distributions immediately. So on these inherited IRAs, you can't wait until you turn 70 and a half or 72, you start taking it immediately. But it used to be that you can stretch it, stretch these distributions over the course of your expected lifetime. So if you're in your 40s, you can take these distributions over several decades. Uh, that would usually result in pretty minimal tax hits every year. Well, now under the new rule, you actually have to take all the money out of this inherited account within 10 years. So there's no annual minimum amount. You can decide to take it all out today. You can take 10% every year for the next 10 years, or you can wait 10 years and take all of the money out of the account then. Why we see this as a potential negative is going back to my example. If you're in your prime earning years, 
you're making significant income, you're already pushing those higher income tax brackets. Well, if you inherit an IRA with in the six figures, five figures, seven figures, and you need to make some significant distributions, well, that's going to be added on top of your income and push you into the very highest income tax brackets. So this is definitely one that we'll be reviewing with our clients. Um, and so this is one that's gonna really catch the attention for estate attorneys, CPAs. So stay tuned on this one. Uh, I should mention, as it says here, that if you've already inherited an IRA before January 1st, 2020, you're in the clear, you're grandfathered into the old rules. Uh, one nice provision that Congress left untouched is that you can donate up to $100,000 from your IRA starting at age 70 and a half. And so they kept the age at 70 and a half. They didn't push it up to 72. So this is great news because if you have any charitable intent, you can write a check directly from your IRA. What this accomplishes is that, A, you're contributing toward uh, your philanthropic effort, and B, you are not reporting this as taxable income on your tax report, uh, on your tax return. So this is an above the line deduction. Um, so again, this is great. And it also counts toward your required minimum distribution. So fortunately, Congress left this one untouched. And another positive that change that came from the SECURE Act is that beginning in 2020, you can make contributions to your traditional IRA after reaching age 70, 70 and a half. So it used to be that once you reached 70 and a half, if, even if you were working well into your 70s and 80s and you wanted to contribute toward an IRA, you couldn't do it. But luckily Congress did acknowledge that people are continuing to work. People need to continue to build their nest egg even in their 70s. So you are able to make contributions to an IRA now no matter what age you are. Great, so switching gears and talking about market movements a bit. So knowing market trends is a great way to stay ahead of the market movements, increase your long-term returns, and also avoid some of the more costly mistakes that investors tend to make. So looking at the next chart, the stock market moves cyclically. So it as you see with the diagram, it was kind of like a roller coaster, where as you know, things are going up, people get encouraged, confident, excited, then the uh, FOMO sets in, the fear of missing out, and they say, you know what, I gotta get in on this, I'm gonna invest at the top point where it's euphoric. And then unfortunately, as markets start to correct themselves, as I mentioned, they move in a cycle, things come down a bit, people are surprised and nervous at first, and then they go into full-blown panic mode and say, you know what, I gotta sell, I gotta pair my losses and get out while I can. And unfortunately, this is the exact opposite of how you should be investing. You want to buy low and sell high, not buy high and sell low. So the key here is to stay invested for the long term and try not to time the market. And as we see with the next diagram, timing the market can be a fool's hardy game. Uh, um, the stock market, if we look at from 1928 to 2018, the stock market is generally up more than it's down. So the key is those, those investors who stay invested for the long term and experience these up years tend to win out in the long term. So if we look at a hypothetical example, let's say you invested $10,000 in the S&P 500 on January 4th, 1999, which also happens to be Paul's birthday, <laughs> coincidentally, happy belated. <laughs> and then we look at the a 20, a roughly 20 year period to December 31st, 2018. So for that investor that stayed invested with their $10,000 the entire time, they experienced a 5.6% return each year, year over year. So their $10,000 has grown all the way to thir nearly $30,000 in that time frame. Now on the flip side, let's say you missed just the 10 best days in that time frame. So the 10 best days in almost a 20 year period, your return now is cut only to 2% each year over year, and your 10,000 has only grown to 15,000. So now let's look at a more extreme example. Let's say you missed a month, 30 days. So one month out of roughly 240 months. Now your $10,000 has actually decreased. You've, you've lost 2.3% each year over year. Your $10,000 is now only $6,000. Now on the flip side, if you go all the way to 60, if you've missed the best 60 days, so just two months again out of the roughly 240 that I mentioned, your $10,000 has dwindled almost to nothing because you've lost 7% each year over year 
and your 10,000 has decreased to 2,000 because you were trying to time the market. So the key here is as tempting as it can be to try to think, you know what, I really feel like the market's going to go down. I should be in cash. Don't do it. Stay invested for the long term because if you miss time it, you're really just going to shoot yourself in the foot. And that being said, this is the award-winning team, the Francis Financial family, that we work so hard to bring peace of mind to our clients. And around us is some of the recognition we've re received lately. Um, and while the returns and dollar figures are great, what we're really about is providing that peace of mind to our clients. So anytime our work is recognized, we want to highlight that. And we'd love to see you. Uh, so we do have some exciting events set out for the rest of the year. We've got one actually coming up this Thursday. Uh, it's going to be here in our offices, Thursday, February 6th, starting at 6.30 till about 9 p.m. Uh, the topic of the conversation is what color is your retirement? Ooh, ooh. So definitely a very interesting topic there. There'll be hors d'oeuvres and, of course, wine to really get the conversation <laughs> flowing. Um, so if you're free, please do come on by and bring a friend, colleague, client. Um, we're, we hope to see you there. And we should note that it, this event is for women only. So sorry, gentlemen, you'll have to find another way to figure out what color your retirement is, because even Paul and I are not invited to this. It's open to women <laughs> only. Yeah, I think uh, color for my retirement, I'm seeing blue. I'm going to go with green for mine. Okay. So some natural colors. Yeah. <laughs> we'll, we'll take that offline. But um, I'll leave this on the screen for a little bit. As it says in the bottom here, please reach out to our colleague, Sunana. Uh, you can email her at sunanafrancisfinancial.com to RSVP. In the meantime, I'm also going to check to see if we have any questions today. It doesn't look like it, so we'll just give it another 20 seconds, 20, 30 seconds here. Okay, well, it looks like I guess we left everyone speechless, <laughs> Devon. Mission accomplished. <laughs> so thank you for tuning in, and until next time, take care, everyone. Bye. Bye. Thank you.